Welcome back to Coast View. I really enjoyed that conversation with Dave Dennis. We probably should catch up with him more often because the banking situation, his time seven years with the Federal Reserve, and the fact that he's doing business in so many different states where he has sort of this barometer, you know, his finger on the pulse of this, you know, at least at least the economy in the Southeast region. As you can tell, he's just extremely knowledgeable, smart as hell. I mean, just a really good friend and someone I really enjoy catching up with. Uh, with that said, actually, I look forward to always catching up with my next guest, Sean Tindall, who's the Mississippi Public Service uh, Safety Commissioner. He has a multiple responsibility to Highway Patrol, Mississippi Bureau of Investigation, Mississippi Bureau of Narcotics, and other departments that are critical to public safety in Mississippi. And he's always someone I enjoy catching up with. How you doing, Sean? Doing good. Doing good. It's a beautiful day. And- here in South Mississippi and throughout the whole state today. Well, look, you have uh, you have a lot of political experience. You've uh, you've been a judge. You 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 know you use all that in your current role. I know on a regular basis. But because of your past experience, you know that in an election year, the the session's supposed to be kind of boring. This session has been anything but boring, hasn't it? No, they're, they're, they're rolling on. It, it's like COVID happened and, you know, that kind of messed up, put them back a little bit. And so they're, they're still going on all cylinders trying to catch up, I think, from 2020. And so, no, it, it's, it's uh, been a very busy session, a lot of important legislation going around there dealing with education, public safety, um, you know, taxes. I mean, you know, really the entirety of our state, how we operate. So uh, they've got their hands full. They only got about two or three weeks left and, and then they'll be done and it'll, it will be elected season. Yeah, I had uh, had Delbert Hoseman on the outdoors uh, last week. We had a terrific visit. And in spite of all the busyness and the stuff that I'm sure you're having to pay close attention to involving public safety, he said that they still, he still thinks they might get out a little early. Yeah, you know, I think they were supposed to finish maybe that first week of April. What I'm hearing is the end of March. Uh, possibly a little sooner. And and really, we're getting to the point in the session where they're, they're dealing with conference reports where the, the chairman are getting together and finalizing uh, bills that have been disputed for the last two or three months and then finalizing the appropriations. And so they'll they'll be done. If they can get all that done in the next week or so, then they, they will definitely get out of here a little bit early. You, when you consider what all they've been involved in, it's just really, really incredible. Hey, listen, um, I mentioned some of what you're responsible for. Why don't you kind of give people a sense who not heard us talk before of what you had to say grace over? Well, obviously, the Mississippi Highway Patrol um, is the biggest part of our agency. It, it, when this agency was formed in 1938, uh, it was the Highway Patrol and the Department of Public Safety. Um, over the years, that, that's been expanded uh, to include the Bureau of Narcotics, um, the Mississippi Bureau of Investigations, uh, the Capitol Police, who were recently transferred over, uh, the Commercial Transportation Enforcement Division, uh, the Mississippi Office of Homeland Security, um, the I think I said Mississippi Bureau of Narcotics. We have the Crime Lab, the Medical Examiner's Office, and Driver Services, as well as the Criminal Information Center that co- holds all the data related to the sex offender registry and, and, and does background checks for the state. Um, and we have the uh, Crime Stoppers uh, is also with us, as well as uh, Public Safety and Planning, which oversees millions and millions of dollars of federal grants uh, that come into our state for highway safety and road safety initiatives. So it's a, it's a big agency, about 1,800 employees. Uh, we have about 900 sworn law enforcement officers, so we are your law, largest law enforcement agency in the state. And uh, just a lot of really good men and women that make up this agency that that work tirelessly every day to try to make Mississippi safer and, and uh, a better place for everybody to live. Hey, one of the things I note about following you is that, you know, you're a leader who has a lot to, to think about, worry about. Uh, it would be easy for you to stay in your office and do what you do and work through your your team that you work tirelessly to put together. But you still find the time to get out and touch as many officers as you can in so many, you know, w- w- all across the state, because it seems to me that you don't want to lose sight of what you're there to support. And that's uh, clearly important to you, huh? That's absolutely right. In fact, I, I was talking to one of uh, our admin assistants and I asked her to come in today and said, hey, tell me some things that I can do better around here. And and, and as much as we do that, she said, Sean, you need to you need to go to the first floor, second floor, third floor, and then you need to talk to the folks that work here more. And they need they need to have that interaction with you. And I, you think you're doing a good job of something like that. And then, you know, it, it's always good to reflect. So then when we had our 
executive leadership meeting, I reemphasize to the the leadership team that that as leaders we always have to listen to others and 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 be willing to amend the way we're doing things and 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 look at ways to improve ourselves. And, and part of that is uh, not just listening to each other in, in a bubble, talk about how how great we're doing. We we need to reach outside that bubble and and figure out what we can do better. And so. I think when we go out across the state and you see me meeting with sheriffs, meeting with police chiefs, meeting with the folks that work in our offices, it's all uh, so that I can hear from them and then think of things that I can do better and that this agency can do better. I think it's important to ask the question. I love that you asked the question, what can you do better? You know, it reminds me, so you never know what the perspective is going to be. One of the things I always enjoy doing wherever I was the you know president of a company, I would spend time walking around every day. I'd go, I'd just tell my assistant, I'm, I'm going to go walk. And I just walk all the way through and I say hello to people and, you know, whatever. And so I thought I was doing a really good job at that. And so, you know, I would be very conscious not to interrupt people, you know, if they were working, especially journalists. Uh, I didn't want to interrupt them. I would just kind of pass through and, you know, wave and then move on, move on. And so one day I was asking one of them, I said, you know, they said, you know, we see you more we see you more than we ever saw the other publishers. But what my, my advice to you is st- stick around and talk for a few minutes. And I'm thinking, well, look, which I actually didn't want to interrupt you, you know, um, but no, interrupt me. I, I'd love to have the opportunity to visit with you for a minute. So, you know what? You think you're doing great in those areas, but there's always a perspective about what you can do better. And you, the willingness to listen to that is really important. Yeah. And, you know, and I think for me, a lot of people think because I've been in politics and, and I've always been kind of vocal and outspoken about issues I believe in. But personally, I'm, I'm somewhat of a shy person. And, and so, it, you know, I like to walk around. I like to see. But it is hard for me just to to break the ice, if you will, and interrupt people when they're doing other things or having their own conversation. And and so, again, you know, just things that, that I need to work on and, and, and get better at. And, and, and then. Um, you know, I do think I, I see the importance of that when you're trying to lead folks that, that they want to have a relationship with you. It is important. Hey, you mentioned about the Capitol Police. Did you ever in your wildest imagination think there would be such a flurry of, of discussion and debate around the role and responsibilities around the Capitol Police? Um, no, not, not, not to the extent that it, that it has gotten. I, I do take pride in the fact that I, I think uh, the reason why this discussion is occurring is because over the last uh, two years to a year that we've been really upping the police efforts of the Capitol Police. Um, and since they've been at our agency, I think, I think we've just done a really good job. Um, I, I think we're, we're bringing back a, a sense of policing uh, to, to the city of Jackson and, and the importance uh, that policing plays in, in creating a safe neighborhood, a safe city. Um, and, and so I think we're doing a good job, and I think a lot of folks uh, want to see that expanded. And so there, there's a lot of discussions. And, and, and look, I'll, again, listening to people and learning, uh, I've been to several uh, community meetings, uh, going to various churches in the Capital Improvement District, even outside of the Capital Improvement District, to hear from folks. And, and when I went to the first one, um, I learned a lot. Kenny Stokes, who's a longtime city councilman in, in Jackson and former board of supervisor here, he uh, invited us, and, and we came, and, and I heard – I heard things that I, I did not contemplate. I had thought of Capitol Police as a state uh, law enforcement agency and, and one that was under my purview. I probably lost sight of the importance of community engagement in relation with Capitol Police. And after that meeting, I, I got with the chief and, and based on what we heard, uh, we, we established a, a community resource officer and, and trying to grow that that side of what we were doing at Capitol Police so that we could reach out to the public and better understand what their needs and concerns are and, and really be more of a community-based law enforcement uh, division. I know, listen, and we won't get it. I'm not going to draw you into this. I Just one quick small comment, and then uh, we'll move on. But I, I've watched it very carefully, and I do think the legislature stumbled a few times in things like drawing boundaries and geography. They opened themselves up to some criticism, in some cases significant criticism. But I think the important conversation that's taking place is – Aside from all of that noise that emanates from maybe some not so great decisions along the way, is is what the intention is. The intention is to to create a safer Jackson, a a, 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 a safer capital city, because that's all of our capital city. And the rise in crime in Jackson has been so significant, and there have been so many challenges around it. And it can be solved with good leadership. And we're just trying to figure out what's the best way to do it. Race has become part of the conversation. I hate that that's that. 
always becomes part of the conversation in Mississippi, sadly, but maybe, you know, realistically, there's no way to avoid it. But at the end of the day, the intentions are there to do what we need to do, which is to make this capital city more safe. And um, that's where your head is, isn't it? Absolutely. And, and, and like when, when people are asking me my opinion on it, one of the things I emphasize is we're going to do whatever we're asked to do. We're, if we're tasked to do more, we'll do more. Um, but the ultimate goal for us is public safety. Uh, and we want to do it the right way. Uh, and we want to make sure that we're, we have trained officers that are protecting the communities and are protecting defendants' constitutional rights. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a balance of doing all those things. Um, but I know the legislature feels the same way, and, and they're wanting that. Hey, let's do. Let's uh, we'll pick this up on the other side because this issue around the rise of crime is not just specific to Jackson. It's uh, the, the 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 men and women who are engaged in violent crime are getting younger and younger, and, and it's a really really significant problem for America. We'll, we'll come back to that on the other side. We'll see you after this. We're visiting with my friend, uh, the Commissioner of Public Safety from Mississippi, Sean Tindall. When we went to break, I was mentioning that the that the crimes across Mississippi, really across the nation, have become more violent. The, the 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 people involved in those crimes have gotten younger. And and Sean, when I was a, the publisher of the Times Picayune, I spent a lot of time with Mayor Mitch Landry, and Mitch was on a mission to try to do something to solve the problem. He came to realize that. For number one, it's very, very complicated. It is multi-generational in the way that we need to fix it. It's a, it, it is, you, there's a very few things you can do tactically. Certainly, more more police presence and those kinds of things are important. But, but you know, it's, in the case of New Orleans, you're talking about 50 percent of African American men were unemployed, and and you had you didn't have like Crips and Bloods. I'm not telling you anything you don't know. You had neighborhood gangs that are more dangerous and more competitive and younger, and they had weapons that are more you know, if you can say weapons are more dangerous, certainly the kind of weapons they have access to are more dangerous. And man, here's the thing that he said to me, these, that the majority of young men that he talked to don't want to really be in that situation. They, they are just scared to death, man. They're just trying to survive, and they literally don't believe that they're going to be alive tomorrow. So every action they take today is within that context. And he says, man, when you look at it like that, it is really, really a difficult problem. But that sounds familiar to you, doesn't it? Absolutely. And, and you look at what's happened. And when I go to community meetings in Jackson, one of the things I try to emphasize is this isn't just occurring in Jackson. Don't don't think this is just um, a complaint about crime in, in the city of Jackson and nowhere else in Mississippi. Gulfport has its issues. Um, other cities on the coast have issues. Uh, we just had a, a shooting about a month ago in Louisville uh, where a group of teenagers with a, a AK, I think, 47 uh, was fired over 60 rounds into a vehicle of other teenagers. And so you know, the, the, these things are occurring at a more rapid pace, and, and uh, it's – the kids hold some responsibility. These, these young juveniles hold some responsibility. But, you know, we've got to ask ourselves, what are the adults in the room doing, and, and how are they letting it get to this point? And, unfortunately, uh, it has become multigenerational. Uh, you look back to 2002, 2003, when I was working in the youth court in Harrison County, we had over 500 bed space statewide for juvenile delinquents. Um, today we have 40. And so a lot of these juvenile delinquents are, are going right back out in the community, right back to the schools they were in. Um, and instead of going to a, a training academy like at Columbia or Oakley, um, they're coming right back into the community and wreaking havoc. And, and we've got to find a way to get to these kids earlier, uh, give them more opportunities, a sense of opportunity. and and. You know, it was a time we talked about grandparents raising their grandkids. Now we're talking about great grandparents raising their great grandkids, and 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 it's two or three generations of this cycle of neglect and abuse. And and um, you know, at some point we have to recognize there's an issue, and, and we can't just police our way out of it. Um, but we've got to find the community and teach them what it means to value children, um, and give them homes in which they're valued, and and then give them opportunities. So um, it's, a, it's an American problem, and I don't see us talking about it. I, I, one of the things that came to mind <clears throat> when the two Americans were killed recently in Metamorphos, Mexico, um, and boy, you could just wall to wall is all you could see on the news that these, these people were killed. But when you think about the number of people that have been killed in the crossfire on I-10 in New Orleans, 
We're not talking about it. And how many people have been caught, killed in the crossfire in Chicago and Detroit and whatever? We've really got a problem in this state and, and, and in this in this nation. And one of the things that you, as a former judge and a senator, and you you care deeply. You've been building this organization. You want to reach out to the African American community. You want to reach out to all communities and try to figure out how we can solve this problem together. The more you learn about it, though, the more focused you have to be on it. I mean, it's it's got to be just a time consuming almost life-altering realization that you're going through. Yeah, and, and look, at the end of the day, I realize from this position, um, you know, I, I can't solve these issues across the state, but I, but I do think we need to find a way to encourage community leaders and community activists, the ones that are trying to get into the schools um, and, and a lot of these uh, nonprofit programs that, that bring value. And you have to be careful with that because a lot of these nonprofits can be filled with fraud and, and we don't want to waste that money. But but if you can identify the ones that are passionate about improving their communities, uh, they can go in and make a real difference. And we and we got to work with folks like that. Um, and it's so, so important uh, going down to the local level, because, again, we, we've got to change those mindsets and change those thoughts. And and we got to have honest conversations and it can't always come back to race. It can't always come back to the narratives that that a lot of the media will strive. You talk about Mexico and that makes the news. and if we have an officer involved shooting and it involves a minority, that makes the news. If it involves a white person, it doesn't make the news. If you have a missing white girl, it makes the news. It, there's thousands of missing black girls, but that never makes the news. And it's all part of these narratives that, that tend to be driven. And it keeps people from focusing on, on what the real issues are and talking about those issues. I mean, it's a, it's a, it is it's a morning when you see missing minority girls go missing all the time and, and nobody picks it up. Well, listen, we're out of time for today, but you know what we need to do? We'll come back together again and talk more about this because I, I share your passion for the subject. There is a narrative about Mississippi that we somehow can't cut, cut through. And in, unfortunately, some some media in Mississippi, anytime race is involved in any way, they do everything they can to stoke it. And then that all that does is, is stoke the national narrative of Mississippi that often is not fair. It's just simply not fair because efforts are underway to try to solve that. And we can't solve things because we can't cut through all the noise around it. And uh, the only way to do it is at a grassroots level. I know you're working to do that. So this has been Sean Tendo. We'll, we'll continue our conversations with him in the near future because I know that everybody's thinking about this subject. Have a great day, and we'll see you tomorrow.